everybody and welcome back to the test screening. My name is Chloe. And my name is Billy. Starting off this week, Billy, um, you've got an article to share with me. <laughs> you sent me this uh, just randomly on Facebook. It's a list of the 50, 50 greatest superhero movies of all time. Please explain uh, why this was sent to me. <laughs> so it's, why? It's um. So it's a fairly recent article. It's, I think it's the 29th of June this year. Was it published today? Actually, no. It's um. It's a 2022 list. But um, it just randomly popped up on my Facebook feed again, and I thought, oh, thinking it was a bit more recent, I thought, oh, let's um, let's check it out. Let's see if I what my feelings are on the placements and my god i have strong opinions on i was it's diabolical like some of these placements i'm just like what were these people thinking i mean historically the superhero genre isn't hasn't been a favorite of mine but you know even me i'm just like you know to think half the mcu films on aren't on here and ghost rider is at 49 is just and you know Scott Pilgrim, but <laughs> I know, I know, Nick Cage. Oh, I don't know. And then Scott Pilgrim versus the World, which I wouldn't necessarily consider a superhero movie, but if we are, you know, positioning it in that canon, I would say it, it's far more visually creative and witty and sarcastic, and wears its comic book influences visually and directorially on its sleeve in a really interesting way, to the point where it should be f- far higher on this list. Like you immediately look above it and you've got the old guard at 45, that really tepid and dreary, you know, supernatural action film. I quite enjoyed the old guard. Would I rank it? I like, would it make the, I don't think it would make the ranking, but I enjoyed it. (laughs) And I just, I just love how you've got like the old guard and then at 45, then Batman, the movie at 44, the, you know, the pop whack thwack variety. (laughs) Of Batman films from 1966 to 44, and then you've got the original Thor, and then the Lego Batman <laughs> film. I'm like, what, what, what was the metric that was used in ranking this? I want to know. I want justification. And then, um, yeah, you, know, you get some Avengers. You get the Dark Knight Rises of 40, and the fact that you, know, I get, you know, there was some interesting Sam Raimi influence, um, popping up in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, but that above the Dark Knight Rises, really? <laughs> well, actually, and... I think I would put that. I'm not a big Batman fan. I just can't take him seriously. And Heath Ledger's performance is amazing in that film. I've got to say that's the only thing that I really enjoyed about it. I found the rest of it a bit of a drag, to be honest. You're not a fan of um, Batman as like a serious crime drama? No, I just think it's his voice, ultimately. Um, <laughs> I just, he dresses like a bat. The Lego Batman movie was more in line with my taste than mm-hmm. usual Batman. Um, I just find it like, you know, when, when think, people take things too seriously, but they're dressed as a bat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, but then, um, then just the, the eye roll is like continue. Like you've got above those, you've got Ant-Man at 35, which I just think is just dryness in a superhero film, like personified. You've got Unbreakable at 32, which I really rate. Like, that film is seriously underrated. X2 is number 17. Sorry, I just saw that. X-Men 2 is at number 17. That, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, in a, bit of a, in a bit of a crime criminal move, I haven't seen the original X-Men trilogy. What? Really? I know that's going to come. I've, I've seen First Class. I've seen Days of Future Past. I've seen Apocalypse. Like, I've seen the prequels. And like the reboots and stuff, but I've never seen the original trilogy, which I know is a Absolutely shocking omission on my part. Although, to be fair, the first one's good. I don't think you're really missing that much with the other two. They're fine. You, you watch them for Hugh Jackman. That's the main thing. Yeah, we watch them for Wolverine. Exactly. The Crow, the crow at 29, like that placement, but, you know, the fact that Deadpool's above the Crow, you know, I, that's giving me pain in my veins <laughs> sort of feel, feeling that on an emotional level i really like and, um, i really like that hellboy made the list yeah i love hellboy that's a, that's a, yeah cornerstone of my i mean kind of dark to be a cornerstone of my childhood maybe my, my later childhood years like maybe eight or nine but 
<laughs> yeah, I just later love... childhood years, eight or nine. <laughs> I like how you're like, oh yeah, probably around eight. I was uh, old enough to be watching twelves or fifteens. <laughs> that was the, <laughs> that's the threshold. Um, I can't remember the exact age, but um, but no, I, I oh, love the yeah, I, I love the love gothic. Yeah, like the gothic art style and um, how sort of kind of like semi serious and dark and sinister it was. But then of course you had to go and ruin it with David Harbour. Although, I, although I'm not sure that's David Harbour's fault, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, but, um, they didn't reboot it particularly well. Wonder Woman in the top ten. How? <laughs> I mean, it's it's fine. I think it like sometimes. Okay, The Incredibles should be at number one for a start. Absolutely, one hundred percent. But I will say, like, I think some of these are kind of like they were the first to do something. Like some of the ones on this list, they mm. were kind of innovating something. Um. I think Wonder Woman does have a place in pop culture history. It is kind of an iconic film. I think I think for what it did for sort of feminist icons and female protagonists in um, in the superhero genre, I definitely think it had some influence there. But I don't know. I didn't find it particularly engaging when I saw it. Maybe I should give another shot i think it's been a while on that one however i do heavily mess with a lot of the entries in the top 10 like avengers endgame at four i can get behind that i can really get behind logan at three and whilst it wouldn't be my personal number one i i can't say like black panther is an invalid choice i enjoyed black panther but- I, th- I find black panther very uh re-watchable as well out of the the Marvel movies, like it's got a good kind of self, even though in the bigger universe, I think it's got quite a good self-contained story within it. I think it's one of the the better Marvels for that. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the best Marvels too, and it has that great combination of you know, the the massive cultural touchstone it was, and like, well, you know, what a cultural phenomenon it was at the time, and sort of it being socially significant for black representation in superhero films and also just having a great central performance having some interesting social points on like like the villains motivations kind of making sense and also just being really well made by ryan coogler just being great from a filmmaking technical perspective as well just really well directed and shot um I mean, you know putting aside some of the slightly dodgy cgi towards the back end but yeah i i can't i can't complain too much about black Panther being number one and i have to say i'm very also very happy and to see Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse at number six, although I would I would place it above Spider-Man too, personally. But on the topic of Spider-Man, our first review of the week is the new entry into the rebooted animated Spider-Man trilogy, kind of the multiverse Spider-Man series, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Have you seen this? I have not, and I feel awful about it because the... Last Spider-Verse movie, I loved. I adored it. It was probably... I think it's actually one of my favourite superhero films of all time. Probably, in my opinion, the best Spider-Man film. And I like a lot of the Spider-Man films. So, that's a high bar. Um, But I really, really enjoyed the last one. I really liked the characters. I... um, Yeah, I'm annoyed that I haven't seen this yet, actually. And you're going to make me very jealous. (laughs) <laughs> oh I, I think i think i am i saw it on a very large screen and i'm so glad i did so as as we're saying like the first entry into this new trilogy of spider-man films it, it kind of not only single-handedly you know, revamped the entire franchise but it also raised the bar for like the screenwriting and i think plot sophistication and character development that could be you know exhibited when telling a story within the realms of the multiverse sometimes when you get a multiverse story it can be so fragmented that you don't really get a proper direct emotional through line, but I th- and like remember remember to have the attention to like the humor and keeping things you know entertaining you know within all the lore of jumping between different universes. But into the Spider Verse um, accomplished that with you know roaring success, and it was more vibrant and funny and intelligent and moving than I think any Spider Man movie that came before it. And needless to say, you know for that reason, expectations were set exceedingly high. For across the Spider Verse, but somehow, and I, I, I didn't think this was out of the question, but I, I didn't expect them to, to smash the bar quite to the degree that they did. But 
I think they've raised the bar, like not just for Spider-Man films and superhero films here, but for animated films in general. Like to detail the huge elephant in the room first, the animation. Like, what do I even say about the animation in Across the Spider Verse? From the very first frame right up until the end, it's filled to the brim with some of the most breathtaking animation like I've ever seen on screen. It's not exactly new for films to like switch animation style from scene to scene, but like the sheer volume of different techniques alongside the frequency with which it's altering, often in like the middle of a conversation, like right in the middle of a dialogue scene, it's just absolutely staggering. Like the cell shading, the stop motion, the hand drawn, like the Lego stop motion as well, they even dip into that for a sequence, like the rotoscoping and the CG. Um, assisted animation is all absolutely eye-popping. There's this a particular note to me was how some of the shading had this like opaque, fog-like, hazy texture to it, which I found really like visually alluring. And like the sharpness of some of the intense colour changes were really attention-grabbing. You know, this isn't all just for show either. The, the colour palette will often like darken or brighten or alter in any given scene, like dependent on the emotional characteristics or tone of a particular moment. It, like it gives the film like a really intelligent layer of visual storytelling that I just loved. You know, this this isn't just eye candy for eye candy's sake or to just pull you into something and make up for the fact that there isn't a lot of plot detail that's used to build it out. Like it's you it's used to enhance the the screenplay and the subtleties of the screenplay, which I obviously get a massive kick out of. And it's like the style of the animation is also selected, like dependent on the backstory and vibe of a particular character. There's a there's a character who has this anarchic, punk-inspired personality who's and he's animated and brought to life with this rugged, hand-drawn cardboard cutout-like quality, which is greatly reminiscent of the the DIY artwork and iconography associated with like English punk bands of the 70s and 80s, like The Clash or the ruts or the sex pistols, you know, I, and I thought that kind of detail and like cultural, you know, reference and sensibility was like, was really smart and really in, entertaining. In terms of structure, you know, even at two hours and 15 minutes, you know, it's not sure. It's absolutely packed out and it moves like an absolute bullish. It fires along with the speed of a freight train. It's paced so fast. And yet the visual storytelling, it's so coherent and clear and like consistently inventive um rather than rather than being disorient disorientating uh, and there is such clear messaging and, and sprightly humor in the dialogue that even at its quickest it it still feels very accessible and easy to keep your grip on where you are in the narrative or where you are in kind of like the the space and time sort of continuum of the, the various universes you know it never some people have described it as exhausting and not, not necessarily in a bad way because even the reviews I have seen describe Across the Spider-Verse as exhausting have, you know, tremendously praised it. But for me, it it was so well balanced in terms of its quieter moments and its faster paced action, action sequences, its humour and its more emotive exchanges between the characters that it, you know, its, its rhythm and its peaks and valleys in terms of intensity were just so perfectly balanced that it just it just didn't tie me out and i was just at the end of two and a quarter hours was just like left wanting more which i guess is all you could ask for you know you know all of this would go completely to waste however you know if the, if the character interplay was like thinly drawn and if there wasn't like an emotional core at the center of it all for the audience to invest in but the screenplay knows exactly when to pause for an intimate and steadily you know emotive and heartfelt dialogue between two characters it gives much needed breathing room and it also just goes to show how effortless, effortlessly like natural the voice performances are and how they robustly flesh out the characters you know the actors well known and not as well known you know really give it their all and it it's one of the best voice casts voice casts that you know i can remember seeing in a long time but perhaps the best overall thing about across the spider verse is that it really and that for me really sends it into the stratosphere of superhero movies, animated movies, and actually like just movies that have been released this year in general, is that it, it so intelligently uses the mechanics of time travel, the multiverse, and alternate timelines to really compellingly examine very real coming-of-age issues that we've kind of 
seen in films before and you could just in coming of age films before and you could describe as tropes but because they're kind of melded in with this you know sci this sci science fiction context it gives them sort of a new sort of thematic slant and way of looking at them you know fear of the future worrying about whether or not tragedy or struggle is inevitable or can't be avoided can you know the path and course of things be changed by us and should risks be taken on that basis in metric wondering if it's possible for the current version of yourself to head in an entirely new direction and become you know a different person entirely you know to use science fiction and the fantastical to ponder these kind of issues as excellently as they do you know in amongst the biggest assault of visual splendor and ingenuity i can remember seeing in an animated film you know ever is a real achievement and so, some have complained that it feels incomplete due to it following the structure of a, in, in inverted commas, part one film. And it is true that it ends on a cliffhanger, looking, and it's kind of clear as to where it's looking towards, you know, it, it, it's signalling towards a third entry and a final sort of climactic act in the trilogy. No, but it's su- on its own terms and on its own sort of complete arc and basis, it's, it's bursting with plot development and character progression on its own and sets out its own distinctive ask arc that it fills by the conclusion of its runtime, whilst also whetting our appetites for the epic final film. And for a middle entry in a trilogy, I think it fulfills that purpose perfectly. And I really don't think I can fault it on, you know, I mean, I have only seen it once, and I do think story, extra story details and visual details will be gleaned on future viewings. But upon my initial viewing, there wasn't anything that jumped out to me as being particularly wrong with Across the Spider-Verse. And I had an absolute blast from beginning to end. But it also had real substance at the heart of it, too. I would say that it is currently in competition with Rye Lane. <laughs> as my film of 2023 so far, I would give it an A+. Plus. I think it's an absolute must see if it is still in cinemas on the biggest screen possible you will not regret it it's absolutely fantastic i'm uh, tomorrow tomorrow i'm gonna do it i'm gonna find it <laughs> i need to see it all of that praise Ah, uh, yes absolutely i need to go and see it wait sorry just, just one more one more thing they do that they, they do the meme i mean they did the meme in you know the pointing at each other meme they did it they did it with Andrew Garfield, Tom Holland, and Tobey Maguire in the live action one. But the way they do it here had the entire cinema absolutely howling. It was perfect. Um, and yeah, that was just the, that was just the icing on the cake, the cherry on top. I do apologise to the viewers for my coughing and spluttering. By the way, I am ill. I am very <laughs> ill. Um, and you know, we're just gonna get. We're just gonna get through. We're just gonna power through this episode. Um, but I do want to listen to everything that Billy wants to say so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm coughing mid, mid-sentence um, so our next review and this is also uh, one of the most hyped series I think of recent years it's been a while since I've remembered um, a show where everybody seems to be watching it and everyone seems to be talking about it in the way that the bear is being talked about um, it feels like it's everywhere at the moment, and quite rightly so. So this is The Bear Season 2. I did not complete a mission to binge watch it in a week. <laughs> um, I'm still on episode 3. Uh, I suck, I'm sorry. So I'm going to let you <laughs> take the reins on this, um, and please don't spoil it for me, because I know where you live, and uh, there will be consequences. <laughs> So with that with that firmly in mind, um, what did you think of The Bear Season 2? Well, for anyone who knows me, I don't think I need to articulate just how through the roof my excitement was for this second season because I was head over heels in love with the, the ingenious thematic mirroring of a crumbling restaurant brigade repairing alongside the mending of a dysfunctional family unit in Season 1 of The Bear featuring a New York fine dining chef heading back to his rundown Chicago family sandwich restaurant left to him in the will of his brother after his brother commits suicide. And 
the the ensemble cast was superb and well developed the editing and sense of pace fluid and perfectly controlled the writing like caustically funny and deeply profound it was far and away one of the best tv series of 2022 so naturally and and considering the ending of season one was fairly conclusive you know it, it could have actually been a mini series in its own right and i would have been completely fine with that i think most people would there was kind of a collective hint of trepidation going into this second outing you know considering how emotionally satisfying the ending of the first season was you know will we hit a sophomore slump will the magic not be recaptured will the story be stretched beyond its limits and more than it can take and more than is sort of sustainable and more than there is to say but you know what they may have topped their first efforts. I think I'd have to do a rewatch just to make sure, but I, I think the highs they reach in this season are higher than that of season one. And there are so many highs to talk about. So we begin things after the sort of discovery of a very large amount of money um, at the end of season one that sort of spells the the repairing and fixing of all the the gang's problems for the restaurant at the end of season one but then as they grow t- and it's it's signal at the end of season one that we will be going from the restaurant that is the beef to the bear you know the family name of the main characters and but as as we open on season two you know things are not that simple you know there's a full renovation to be done you know we've got an entire menu to construct you know an entire set of financial and logistical and safety issues to work out and so from episode one when they you know get their finances in order and get some more funding on the way the countdown is on to the season finale where they will conduct their first service and open as the bear now one of the things that season two does so smartly right at the outset is that for for the most part the atmosphere and rhythm and pacing is almost entirely different from that of season one. I think you'll have noticed that in the first couple of episodes, Chloe. We, you know, we begin with a very restrained and quiet sequence of Marcus with a dessert chef, you know, looking after his sick mother, the opening scene of the first episode. And this beautifully sets the tone for what will partially be a more meditative and somber season. The camera is more static and pulled back. The, be- the blue hues of the grade more pronounced, you know, the dynamics and interaction between the cast more earnest and hushed now that, you know, the, the initial sort of volatility has been sort of kind of surpassed and everyone's kind of a, a bit more on the same wavelength. You know, this second act of the story is beginning from a place of unity and also vulnerability as the characters are opening up more and the show tonally and script-wise has become much more soulful and move moving and sort of mirroring that sort of change of um, sensation with the characters. Another intelligent shift we get is that instead of that pressure cooker kitchen environment and airtight structure and palm sweatingly tense forward momentum of the first season, we have a more expansive plot layout this time around. You know, in the first outing, whilst this the script was even handed with the cast, it was, I think, slightly more weighted to Kami, you know, as the central character. And in season two, we get some absolutely brilliant and such, you know, in emotionally enveloping individual threads and standalone character specific episodes that serve to advance and deepen their characters you know so much more substantially than before both in a life sense and in a cooking sense i think that you know even greater character depth is what i th- is one of the things i think season two does stronger than season one i think you know as as you'll as you've already seen chloe you know t- tina and one of the other chefs they they go they go to culinary school you know marcus has his own sort of excursion out to another country to learn dessert technique. Natina's honing her technical skills in culinary school. You know, in, in the third episode, as you've seen, you know, Sydney looks inwards at you know her own self-confidence and drive to succeed in her culinary c- career whilst studying menus and food and broadening her palate. But for me, this season absolutely, and I'm, you know, no spoilers as to exactly their development, but this season really belongs to Richie. You know, I think now that the season is done, I think I can conf- confidently say he is my favourite character. There is a montage set to the most unlikely song. If I if I describe this montage on paper to you, you would go, what? But when I tell you that I laughed and cried and clapped my hands and cheered, I was. it's just some of the most inspiring TV I've seen in a very long time. And he, even Moss Bachrach has been... Emmy nominated for his supporting performance as Richie, and it's a, it's a magnificent turn. He gives such 
pathos and sadness, but also brings that kind of sense of aggression, but also like an inward self-awareness and sensitivity. Now he gives Richie so many layers. And for me, he is the heart of season two. And that's another thing that season two brilliantly examines. It spends more time away from the kitchen with the cast looking to find how positive influences, fulfillment, purpose. There's a big thing about purpose this season and also enjoyment and fun outside the stresses of the restaurant um, can be achieved. So they lead nourishing and rewarding lives. You know, I, I like I think the expansion beyond food was like essential for making sure the script had legs beyond, you know, just the kitchen environment of season one. And not that the, the, the show, the show obviously always had a mental health and emotional angle, but that is so much more pronounced and dug into this time around. And, you know, Kami's burgeoning relationship with an old flame, um, who you will, you will have seen in the opening couple of episodes, is, you know, poses the question of if he can find that balance. And the, the script also delivers some really wonderful food for thought of, on the topic of why we enjoy making food, what we personally gain from making it and eating it why a career in hospitality and serving others is gratifying for the people who do it, despite the incredibly high pressure environment that it, it sort of, it kind of needs to, well, I guess not needs to occur within, but kind of naturally does. Uh, by balancing these ideas, you know, the bear continues to weave its deeper subtext into the in the moment culinary based plot. I think better than I think any other TV show is currently, I can't think of a show that handles the balance between its emotional subtext and its, base plot stronger than this. You know, the editing's still top notch, the lengthier shots give the quieter moments, the tender space and breathing room they need. But the fast paced montage montages are still here and brill brilliantly utilized at the right moments. You know, I think for, you know we've we've talked about that montage where Sydney's tasting and res restaurant visiting and cooking is kind of intercut with this recurring aerial shot of a completed dish and as she is picturing in her head. And over the course of the montage, we see her efforts move close towards that mental image of a completed dish that she's conceived and how her sort of learning experiences are informing that approach to making that food. And a special mention, I think, has to go to the sixth episode. It's kind of unusual in terms of runtime. You know, the bear typically runs at about 28 minutes an episode. This one's 65 minutes, it's considerably longer. And I, I know you haven't seen it yet, so I won't, I won't say anything else other than that. It's a flashback to before the events of season one. And it is one of the most intense episodes of TV I have ever watched. You know, it gives, you know, mo movies as intense as Uncut Gems um, and like, you know, some tense, you know, gambling based movies, you know, a, a serious run for their money. You know, the dizzying and frenetic handheld camera work, blaring kitchen timers in the sound mix, smash cuts of the timers going off, you know, knives chopping and oven doors slamming with such ferocity, you know, extreme piercing close-ups of eyes during heated verbal showdowns, you know, a terrifyingly mon monstrously aggressive Emmy-worthy guest appearance from, you know, sev you know several, you know, world-class actors in that episode who I won't spoil. But, you know, that episode on its own is nothing short of incredible. And it so amazingly recontextualizes some of the volatile behaviors of characters we've come to see up until this point. And I think watching certain episodes again, you know, you now have, you know, greater empathy and, you know, prescience as to how, you know, people like Richie and Kami, you know, understand, you know, the, their mental distress and where that came from, how that formulated and why they now sort of let, how that, why they now let that bleed into, a, into the kitchen and, why they often view and treat a kitchen as a hostile environment more akin to like a war zone. If I have a couple of minor complaints, I would have liked a little bit more of Tina. You know, she's one of my favorite characters out of season one, and she has some really terrifically inspiring and heartwarming moments here, but I just, I just wanted a little more screen time with her. I feel like the moments we get are really precise in how they show her development, which are great. You know, they, they make perfect use of those moments and, you know, don't waste any time there. But I just, I think it could have, He's a little, a tad more, not necessarily development, but I would have just liked to have seen that, you know, spread out a little bit more, had a little bit more time for that to simmer, you know. And I don't think, I, I don't quite, th I don't know how you feel about the opening couple of episodes, but I'm not sure the gravitas of the restaurant reopening is fully felt until after that, you know, the explosive nature of the sixth episode. You know, but after that, the tension and build-up is in full swing. You know, it is nothing short of riveting, you know, as we run up to the finale. But 
And then there was also an admittedly more minor character who was I thought was given slightly short shrift in that he makes a decision earlier on in the season that I didn't fully understand and I don't think the script fully digs into his reasoning for. And I didn't feel that there is a scene that I think kind of like, I think the show thinks it's resolving that plot line, but I'm not sure it, it fully did. But then again, you know, it's, it is one of the more minor plot lines this season. So that's not a massive complaint. And that, that those are all very minor gripes overall, you know, with this second season, for me, the bear has solidified its statement. You know, now that certain big prestige TV dramas have ended light succession, other you know, big and marvelous Mrs. Maisel and, other dear shows like, you know, Barry and Ted Lasso, you know, I think the bear has absolutely seized the crown with this second season of, in my opinion, the best show currently on TV. I think for anyone who loves drama, you know, in spite of maybe not necessarily being super in, interested in the subject matter, I think, you know, you'd be crazy not to check this out. It's like phenomenal television. Yeah, I've been enjoying it a lot um just these first three episodes it, it, you're right there is like a different pace to it um it's not it doesn't feel as intense yet um i know that it's coming but i think that's what that's another thing that makes a show so good it's kind of those vary those variance in pace one of the things that i loved about the previous season was the way that the conversations became more layered and meant different things when we kind of went back to old arguments and things like that there's definitely a little bit of that still going on here. I I agree. I'm already missing Tina um, a lot. I really enjoyed her in the first season, and I am missing her. Um, but I, you know, with a with a show with so many characters like the bear, you've got to kind. Of, unfortunately, some of them are just going to get the short straw. Um, and you know, maybe if we get a season three. Um, some of the other more neglected characters this time around will will get more more of the spotlight if there's going to be a season three. I don't know mm. if it ends on a. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. But <laughs> yeah, I do think actually the way the way Tina comes back into the fold um, later on in the season is is great and really rewarding. I just would have liked a little bit more time with her earlier on. But again, small small gripe. If 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 her having less time means we get more time with Marcus and Richie, especially with what we get with Richie this season, then I'm happy with that. Billy, talk to me about talk to me. Um, what is this <laughs> film? Very nice. I'm about I've not heard of this one. Um, I'm completely in the dark. So please let me know. Inform. So this is a day. So this is an Australian horror film. It's uh, made by. Produced by A24, distributed in the American market. Um, it's the debut feature from two a uh, from two filmmakers who filmmaker brothers actually who have made a name for themselves. You know, coming up through uh, YouTube. You know, Danny and Michael Philippou. You know, rising to prominence off the back of a very you know successful YouTube channel. And it centers around a group of teenagers, some of whom are dealing with kind of familial trauma and some issues with grief, who stumble upon kind of this social media trend of these guys who are sort of, sort of shopping around an embalmed hand that's encased in sort of plastic, or plasticine rather. And if you kind of hold this hand and say, talk to me, you are allowed to sort of communicate with uh, the spirit realm. And it's kind of a different spirit every time you sort of do that. And they sort of have this thing where you can say, talk to me, and you are kind of experience this kind of micro possession. And, you know, you're strapped into a chair. You're allowed that sort of experience for 90 seconds before, you know, that sort of deemed to be too much or too sort of the spirit would get too volatile and take over too, too strongly. And it, even though it's kind of terrifying in the moment, when it actually provides a real buzz. And um, it's kind of this interesting kind of new, fresh um, original take on, at least on paper plot wise, of the sort of the Ouija board, you know, t teenagers possession, you know, messing with the supernatural, young characters doing that. And I thought the premise sounded really interesting. And it also kind of provides a really, in, you know, great um, performance exercise because, you know, the, the, the more kind of muted, you know, closed off, um, introverted nature of the, the teenage performances or kind of some of the more obnoxious teens, you know, takes on an entirely different kind of sinister and vicious physicality when you know they're possessed by the spirits and you know having the 
and you know the, the characters of the spirits you know being different every time that means they're sort of possessed and behave in a slightly different way but naturally you know treating you know possession and you know we, this ouija board esque scenario is sort of this addictive cycle is um is interesting and kind of had piqued my interest going in and of course you know the a24 pedigree you know their critical dominance in the horror sphere over the past decade you know any new entry from them into the genre is, you know, is now seen amongst audiences as an event. You know, it's, it's a big thing. And whilst I now haven't necessarily been a fan of every one of their forays into horror, you know, you know I have my issues with Climax and Midsummer and, and you know, Lamb as well. Um, they've had enough runaway successes and are so contis- consistently unique in their directorial voices and narrative approaches, even when I don't necessarily, you know, love the final product, you know, I will sprint to anything they release in the horror genre. And I was quite excited about Talk To Me, considering, you know, the, the freshness of the plot that I've just mentioned and how many critics were calling it, you know, a fresh take on this, um, this sort of well-worn thematic and narrative tradition in the horror genre. And its Metacritic score, I mean, I know that's not a perfect metric, but, you know, fans are really loving it. And its Metacritic score was only a few points shy of Barbie's. And, you know, we both know how much I love Barbie. Uh, the trailer looked in, the trailer looked enticingly devilish, and so I, t- I took all of this to be a good sign. Sadly, whilst I wouldn't go as far to say I dislike it, I'm not quite as sold on Talk to Me as I think a lot of other critics and horror fans are. But I think there's certainly elements of it that show a great degree of promise from the you know the first time filmmaker brothers, you know Danny and Michael Philippou. Um, I think they display a clearly deft hand at visually and sonically executing the, you know this kind of material. The film begins with this propellant, you know, two to three minute unbroken steady cam tracking shot for a party that's really well done. It really kind of like pulls you, you know, by the lapels into the into the story and into the intensity of it. The possession sequences have these very tight, regimented, sudden, you know, 90 to 180 degree tilts, almost like a whip pan, but like vertically, kind of like at the opposite angle, it's sort of like throw you almost kind of upside down visually. It's you know very kind of excitingly disorientating. In terms of the overall kind of hue and colour scheme of the film, it kind of reminded me of a more saturated and sleeker take on like the visual character of another Australian modern horror classic, The Babadook, which I love, and seemed to all also to me be reminiscent of that stark, eerie and disturbing atmosphere and visual character of very po-faced and cold-blooded, disturbing Australian crime dramas like Snowtown and Animal Kingdom. You couple those visuals with really brilliant sound design. You have a work that builds atmosphere pretty well. You know, there are some supremely chilling moments where, you know, some ghostly singing or scratching against walls is like hard pans to one side of the mix, you know, in a in a 5.1 Dolby Atmos cinema, you know, which had me turning around in my cinema seat several times, like, where's that coming from? Is somebody making a weird noise to my left? It's like, oh no, that's actually the that's the sound design. Um, which I think speaks to how sort of convincingly unnerving it is. And the scrapes and also bangs and crashes, particularly that of people smashing themselves hard into tables and walls, are loud, sharp, and incredibly forceful in the mix. You know, they're hit with a lot of oomph. And, you know, combine that with some vicious body horror and demented supernatural visuals. And you have moments where, the, you know, where scares are delivered with like a visual bluntness comparable to that of the most recent Evil Dead film, which I found, you know, deliciously, you know, gruesomely entertaining. You know, so that's, you know, good praise there. Now, these all provide, you know, several ghastly thrills, but unfortunately, Talk To Me really falls down due to the character development and wider plot and messaging just not being given the same care of attention, frankly. You know, I've seen some people say that it has depth and i'm like really because i'm just not getting that um the narrative is sim- is simply for me too incidental and trope laden to embody that freshness and excitement that many are describing it as having you know the, the very nonchalant introduction of the embalmed hand as a social media trend recorded at parties that the characters kind of practically stumble upon does more smoothly integrate the supernatural and the horror sort of catalyst into the world of the film, you know, rather than you know, spawning from a really cliche, you know, someone makes a really dumb decision set up that kind of releases demons or whatever. But it, but that also robs that plot point of kind of the grave build up and sort of horrific explosion that you'd want when the cast are getting involved in something sinister like that. 
It also makes the general narrative foundations of the film kind of feel pretty rickety and thrown together. And the concept of the buzz experience from micro possessions becoming a sort of addiction is very novel, but it's not actually developed much outside of, of one very deranged montage. You know, it's kind of shown earlier on, and I wouldn't say forgotten about, but it's not really built upon much. It's not really you know given much more of a thematic you know or narrative push later on. You know that, and that plot point is also somewhat soured by the cliched. Characters don't stick to their principles and push something too far, which then, you know, negatively impacts someone's development, which is then used to instigate the problem that leads to much of the tension in the latter half. So that feels kind of like a cop out in terms of falling back on some horror cliches, which I feel like part of the film is above. On a character and thematic level, it's almost painfully thin and uninspired, actually, you know, to be, you know, to be honest. There's some very half hearted relationship, love triangle drama. And a very perfunctory plot line revolving around a protagonist grieving the loss of a parent that is then making it difficult to maintain a healthy relationship with the other parent. I've seen that idea and theme portrayed so much more emotively and unpacked with infinitely more depth in many, many other horror films. So that just kind of, you know, read to me as just being, you know, aping, you know, well worn narrative material and just not executed with the same level of finesse or depth. You know, aside from that, some of the characters are so one note and with very little in the way of defining characteristics or distinct personalities that it's difficult to invest in them, even though the director makes the quite smart move to focus in on one character's particular perspective and experience on the events that unfold rather than just kind of, you know, waveringly, you know, moving between, you know, a group of, you know, largely undeveloped teens. The ending is kind of, is it's, it's somewhat unsatisfying it is haunting and the way the fi- the very final moments tie into the supernatural law of the film is actually really nifty and smart and i feel like but but in a macro sense it doesn't really resolve the protagonist's main arc or feel as though it logically ties up the plot po- the you know the overarching plot points that came before and i feel like in that sense you know the the base level kind of horror of the ending and kind of the ghostliness of it yeah it, it kind of just loses its some of its impact for me whilst it's it's paced well enough and compact enough at 90 minutes with some very effective scares to be mildly entertaining whilst it's on but i can't help but feel like this is just largely a missed opportunity for me you know due to having nothing really of substance to say beyond the beyond you know some of the 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 addictive possessive stuff which like i've said you know isn't really pushed to the degree you would want it to and ultimately, you know, given the fact that it's entertaining while it's on, but not doesn't have a lot of staying power in a thematic sense, means it's pretty expendable in the wider horror canon. Not bad, again, you know, solid while it's on, but I'm, I'll give it a B minus. It doesn't really do a whole lot for me bef- beyond some sort of short, sharp shock to the senses. Okay, for our final review, um, you've got to do the theme tune with me. Are you ready? <laughs> oh, dun, no. dun, dun. <laughs> I feel like we were very out of sync there, but you know, it's oh, we we definitely were music to people's ears, probably. Um, so this is the nails on chalkboard, more like coughing, dying. Uh, this is the latest addition to the Indiana Jones franchise, the latest, and I believe the last edition. Um, Harrison Ford is back as the titular character, and it's been met with some mixed reviews, to say the least. But what were your thoughts? <laughs> so, I mean, there's not a, hot, a tremendous amount to say about the plot, other than, you know, a figure from Indy's past comes back into the present. He's kind of at retirement age, but he's roped back into one final um, archaeological quest that will, of course... Uh, have the the fate of the world resting upon it, and of course Nazis get involved because that is just the Indiana Jones way. Um, I mean, we knew from its you know premiere out, out of the Cannes Film Festival that it, Dial of Destiny did not receive the most glowing endorsements. Lukewarm was very much the vibe I was getting from the reviews, and this coupled with it being you know so long since the last entry in the franchise, and and that entry not even being a good, a good one left me with pretty minimal enthusiasm to go and see this newest entry. 
Although, given my fondness for the original trilogy, you know, especially Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, I, tr- I tried to go into this with an open mind. I did come out feeling largely the same as a lot of the critics, though. I have seen some pretty scathing reviews of it, and I think some of that hate isn't entirely warranted. You know, I think there are things to like, but overall, I, I would come out saying I, I, I feel largely, you know, indifferent to it. There, there is something to be said for, for an action franchise, actually, that it tends to rest its laurels on an atmosphere of nostalgic adventure, an old-fashioned Treasure Island-esque you know, sense of discovery. And I, I do think Dial of Destiny does still do a, you know, a somewhat serviceable job of carrying that off. That being said, the general tonal feeling of this latest entry is one of dryness, of the cogs being rusty, of the tune not quite hitting with the, you know, the same harmony and tunefulness that it once did. And I think this is in part due to the the mid-tier, very unemphatic performances that don't so much chew the scenery as much, you know, sluggishly limp limp through it. The sepia-tinged grade, you know, why do do so many franchise reboots, so many films nowadays just really love to layer on that saturated brown (laughs) and, you know, slightly muted gold colour? I'm just like, it just makes the whole thing feel visually drab. I'm just like, just stop, guys, please. Um... Yeah, and you know, the surprisingly safe and dormant camera work, you know, doesn't exactly help to inject proceedings with a sense of urgency. I'm a I'm a big Phoebe Waller Bridge fan, but she's badly miscast here as Indy's goddaughter, who who early on, you know, it's not a spoiler station, you know, very early on, you know, in the first little quarter, you know, she reveals, you know, some nefarious, you know, villainous intentions. But she just doesn't have the warmth or affectionate brightness needed to make that betrayal sting when her attentions become apparent. You know, nor the conniving bite that would make her an entertaining thorn in Indy's side. You know, not to mention the fact that her motivations just alternate so frequently throughout the runtime and with no contrast in performance, really, that it just reads of a poorly constructed character. And Harrison Ford, while he's in, you know, decent form, he doesn't seem to drum up much enthusiasm either. And, you know, maybe some some people will read that as, you know, oh, um, old, you know, curmudgeon indie who's, you know, kind of weary and old man-esque, you know, maybe is like Carl from Up, but like, I, it just read to me as a, you know, a, a slightly you know, phoned-in performance. Um, the set pieces as well, some are good, but they're kind of a decidedly mixed bag at the end of the at the end of the day. You know, some have camera work that plunges us right into the thick of like the destruction of a building, you know, intimately track Indy as he falls through the, the foundations of a burning building or, or plays bumper cars with Nazis at high speed and, you know, in, in car chases. You know, the camera almost feels as though it, it's smashing into walls as though, uh, as, you know, walls are burning and collapsing underneath Indy. You know, that's very invigorating and kind of, you know, just a, a, you know a slight injection of you know, visual creativity there. And, you know, the camera hard cutting in line with the impact so we feel the weight of those hits. And it... In, in the cases of the building, you know, it creates interesting, you know, action-related geography. You know, that Indy has to think on his feet and escape from. You know, that gives it a kind of, you know, old Hollywood boots on the ground kind of action adventure, you know, thrust, which I, which I kind of enjoyed for the like, the opening sort of flashback extended sequence. Elsewhere, though, especially in the case of a horse chase through a subway tunnel with you know trains following in the background, and no, and no I'm not making that up. And um, the action is so laden with you know glaringly obvious blue and green screen that it, it it kind of drapes the action in plasticity that makes it uninvolving and lacking any real world stakes or physicality. You know, you know I re- you know we recently talked about Mission Impossible and how much the the stunts in that film you know is crazy as you know the fact that they're done for real you know it, it gives them. You know, this, this human relatable quality, even though people are doing, you know, the most insane things. And the fact that they are pulled off in camera, you know, does a lot for our investment and how we, you know, kind of physically perceive the action. I recent, I also recently praised the new Mission Impossible for having really solid, solid like, narrative justification for the globetrotting missions and activities activities conducted as part of the set pieces. That You know, this, the activities that instigate in the set pieces, you know, result from. Dial of Destiny is the exact opposite. You know, the, the plot is a mess and the historically inspired journey is is far too thin to sustain the bloated two and a half hour runtime. You know, the various set pieces are very loose in their narrative connections. 
The main villain motivation is ill-defined and stretches credibility at best. And there is so little in the way of solid reasoning for why some of these ridiculous action sequences are occurring. I, again, I'm not making this up. There is a car chase that is instigated by a character's disgruntled ex noticing that he was given a fake wedding ring. That That's not a joke. That is an actual instigation for a car chase. You know, imagine my eyes rolling in the rolling back in my skull as I watch this in the cinema. And then just when you think things can't get messier or more ridiculous, the, the film at its climax takes a hard right turn into the fantastical that is so ludicrously preposterous it makes the alien in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull look decidedly was, grounded and, and I was going to mention the alien. It's so ridiculous. I was like, it can't be worse than the alien. Right? Right? I, th- I think... <laughs> I think it's. I think from a filmic and action perspective, it's better executed than the Alien. I think in terms of the actual plot point, it is infinitely oh God, more ridiculous. How could you get more than ridiculous than the Alien? It, it, is that that's what killed oh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull oh. for me? I mean, okay, Shia LaBeouf like dangling from vines was already, you know, a. Yeah, it was, a CGI in, monkeys. it was a step in the wrong direction, but that really just finished me off. Like, that, that Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was not <laughs> it. It really wasn't. Yeah. And then when when that plane just does that thing and goes through that thing in in Dial of Destiny, I really just went, no, no, surely, no, surely not. Oh, oh no, they, they really are. Wow. Wow. <laughs> And it's so ridiculous, I actually kind of respect it. Then, at the very end, it makes a a cloying attempt at sentimental fan service that is so nauseatingly syrupy and lazily incorporated, you know, due to it it barely being telegraphed earlier on in the film, that I was, like, desperately clambering for a sick bag. I was like, oh, come on! Um, Yes, I, I... it's not. It's not as awful as maybe some of my points are making it sound. There are, you know, there is some old-fashioned Hollywood action adventure, action adventure entertainment to be had here, but for the most part, it, it, it's dull and too, too implausible for its own good. I would give this a, a C. And that is our final review for this week. So thank you once again for listening, and Billy, thank you for all of your wonderful reviews. And what have we got coming up? next week so we have the absolute cinematic masterpiece that is the meg 2 oh i can't wait which you know you can't you can't, every every so often a film comes up in the lineup and i just go you can't tell me i don't do my job or i don't or i'm not <laughs> dedicated because lord have mercy would i have ran away as far as possible from the meg 2 if i didn't have to see it um for proceedings here but it may provide a good cocaine bear style rant so maybe there will be some fun to have I, there i'm i'm very excited to see what you think of the meg 2 and i also had the realization i will need to watch the first meg to properly do my research and prep um viewing audience please give me strength have me in your prayers um <laughs> or that ordeal that i'll have to put myself through um we also have the new tinge Tingent, uh, t- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated feature, which I think looks kind of fun. I like the look of the animation. And then we also have a reissue of the late 90s um, debut feature from Sofia Coppola, very kind of stark and interesting drama, The the Virgin Suicides, which is it has a new uh, 4K reissue. And also I saw a film which I saw a preview screening of uh, when it was on the festival circuit that I... Um, that now gives me great pleasure to say will be out uh, over the next week in uh, theatres on wide release, a uh, independent trans focus documentary called Kokomo City. Brilliant. It's good. You know what? I feel like we're the only podcast where you'd have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the Virgin Suicides <laughs> on, the same, on the same lineup. Oh, but, um, can't say we don't switch we out. You know, this is what makes us special. Um, so if if that sounds like a fantastic time to you which it does to me and please give us a watch give us a sorry don't watch us because we are <laughs> on <laughs> we are just we are just disembodied voices we, have we are no disembodied faces. voices um but give us a listen next week bye bye